those who don't know, my name is Todd High. I'm the uh, Navy resident, so thanks for having me today. I'm uh, presenting uh, classification adult spinal deformity. Uh, everybody can hear me okay? See the screen okay? Yep, we got you. Yeah, we got you. Thanks. Um, so obviously I have no disclosures. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to talk about kind of uh, briefly touch on what a good classification is. Uh, we'll go through some of the measurement definitions for adult spinal deformity. We'll go through um, a history of kind of some of the classifications, both etiological and ordinal. Uh, and then we'll kind of finish up with uh, the two kind of main classification systems in use now, the SRS Schwab adult spinal deformity classification and the OBEAD coronal malalignment classification system. Um, so to start, first, accurate classification characterizes the nature of a problem and then guides treatment decision-making, ultimately improving outcomes. Second, accurate classification establishes an expected outcome for the natural history of a condition or injury, thus forming a basis for the uniform reporting of results for various surgical and non-surgical treatments. This allows for comparison of results from different centers purportedly treating the same entity. The successful, successful classification system uh, must be both, both reliable and valid. Reliability reflects the precision of a classification system. In general, it refers to inter-observer reliability or the agreement between different observers. Inter-observer reliability is agreement of one observer's repeated classifications of an entity. The validity of a classification system reflects the accuracy through, with which the classification system described a true pathologic process. A valid classification system correctly categorizes the attributes of interest and accurately describes the actual process that is occurring. And to measure or quantify validity, the classification of interest must be compared to a gold standard. So in 1960, Cohen introduced a kappa value or kappa statistic as a measure to assess the agreement that occurred above and beyond that which is related to chance alone. Today, the kappa value and its variants are the most accepted methods of measuring observer for categorical data. So kappa values range negative one, which is complete disagreement, to zero, which is chance agreement, to one, which is complete agreement, and two different benchmarks are used to assess the kappa value. However, uh, keep in mind, both are completely arbitrary despite their widespread use. Uh, for measurement uh, definitions, the Cobb angle shown here is defined as an angle def uh, defined by the intersection of two lines, one perpendicular to the superior end plate of the most angled vertebra above the deformity and one perpendicular to the inferior end plate below the deformity and greater than 10 is considered to be scoliosis. Public incidence is an angle between a line drawn perpendicular to the sacral end plate at its midpoint and the uh, line drawn from the midpoint of the sacral end plate to the midpoint of the bicox femoral axis. This does not change during spinal pelvic movement. Lumbar lordosis is a sagittal Cobb angle measured from the superior end plate of L1 to the superior end plate of uh, S1. And pelvic tilt is measured be, uh, angle uh, between the line connecting the midpoint of the sacral end plate to the midpoint of the bicoxofemoral axis uh, as a vertical. This changes with positional change, i.e. sitting to standing. And finally, sagittal vertical axis is defined as the offset between the sagittal C7 plumb line and the posterior superior corner of the sacrum. So Schulte, 1905, originally classified scoliosis into five ordinal groups, cervical, thoracic, thoracic, thoracal, lumbar, lumbar, and combined double primary. This largely remained unchanged until Ponsetti in 1950 retrospectively described 394 cases of idiopathic scoliosis that were treated conservatively. Unfortunately, most classification systems uh, primarily dealt with pediatric scoliosis as a technique and technology to treat adult deformity did not mature until recently. So Ponsetti described five curve patterns, which corresponded closely to what Schultes had previously described. He went on to describe where most, uh, which were most likely to progress, most common age of onset, and other descriptive characteristics. In 1973, Goldstein et al. published an etiologic classification where they expanded on the curve patterns. Idiopathic did not have an identifiable underlying cause and was further divided by age. Infantile was under four, juvenile four to nine, and adolescent between 10 years of age and skeletal maturity. Congenital was broken down into abnormal bone development, such as failure of segmentation or formation resulting in various deformities, abnormal spinal cord development, such as myelodysplasia, and congenital due to mixed causes, such as myelomeningocele. Neuromuscular was composed of either neuropathic or myopathic scoliosis. Neurofibromatosis had its own category. Uh, mesenchymal orders, both congenital, such as Marfan's or arthrogryposis, and acquired, such as rheumatoid arthrosis. And finally, the classification category due to trauma, which included fracture, but also included scoliosis due to surgery or radiation as well. And while this classification schema was descriptive and helpful with a natural history of the disorder, it did not provide accurate classification or allow for uh, description of the deformity in such a way as to compare different cases or guide treatment. So 1983, King et al. described their institution's method for selective fusion and how they determined which levels to fuse. 
This is a retrospective review of patients who underwent surgical treatment of idiopathic thoracic or combined thoracic and lumbar scoliosis at Fairview Hospital in Minnesota and Gillette Children's Hospital in St. Paul over a 30-year period, or sorry, Minneapolis. Uh, they define scoliosis curves as shown here. Additionally, they define the stable vertebra that was most closely bisected by a line perpendicular to the iliac crest and centered on the sacrum. They noted that two curve types were, that were selectively fused down, or type two curves that were selectively fused down to the stable vertebra appeared to have spontaneous correction of the lumbar curve. However, once again, this is primarily for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, not adult deformity. It did not account for degenerative conditions, and indeed, at the time, few surgeons were correcting adult deformity. So in 2001, Lenke et al. published a new way to define AIS, which continued to be, has continued to be fairly common and was referenced often during my pediatric rotation. It defined major curves as the largest cob measurement was always considered structural. Minor curves were then assessed with bent side bending films, and they were considered structural if the side bending cob angle remained greater than 25 degrees in the thoracic spine, or the kyphosis was greater than 20 degrees in between two T2 to T5 for proximal thoracic or T10 to L2 for marine thoracic, thoracolumbar, or lumbar. They utilize the SRS definition for location of curve between the thoracic, uh, between T2 to T11, 12 disc, thoracal lumbar is T12 to L1, and lumbar between L1 to L2 disc and L4. Additionally, they define lumbar spine modifiers based on the center sacral vertical line and stable vertebra as previously described. The VSVL was between the pedic if the VSVL was between the pedicles up to the stable vertebra it was a type A medial border of the lumbar concave pedicle and the lateral margin of the apical vertebra was type B and medial to the lateral aspect of the lumbar apical vertebra body or bo vertebral body or bodies was C and finally they added a thoracic sagittal profile and defined it as negative normal or hyperkyphotic. So once again, important to point out, this is only for adolescents. It failed to identify important parameters and been found to correlate with pain and function in adults. However, in terms of classification system, it had excellent inner observer reliability with a capital value of 0.92 among the researchers and 0.893 to 0.97 with seven reviewers who were randomly selected from within the, within the Scoliosis Research Society. However, later, later validation studies had lower kappa values when they weren't using people that were uh, either within the SRS or associated with the study itself. It also had some criticisms in that there were 42 different curve patterns once all modifiers were applied. So this is a prospective self-analysis and evaluation of nutritional and radiographic parameters in a consecutive series of healthy adult volunteers older than 60. There were 75 subjects in the study with no prior history of spine surgery and no known history of scoliosis. The goal is to assess for the prevalence of radiographic scoliosis and assess for any correlation with SF36 scores and nutri nutritional status. No significant correlations were found. However, the prevalence of scoliosis is defined by Cobb angles greater than 10 degrees and shows up as groups two and three in the pie chart with 68%, which was much higher than the 1.4 to 32% previously reported in the literature. So this emphasizes the necessity to define classification systems for adult deformity, one that meets the requirements for a useful, accurate classification system. This is especially important as the demographics of the United States shift in the general population ages. So in 2005, Max IEB proposed an etiologic classification for adult deformity. With this classification, he attempted to identify which types of curves would progress and what treatment, if any, was appropriate. He divided his classification up into three primary types, with the third type further divided twice. Type 1 was primary degenerative scoliosis or de novo form. This is mostly located in the thoracolumbar or lumbar spine and develops mostly on the grounds of limited asymmetric disc degeneration in one or more segments. It could also be termed a discogenic curve. The apex was usually between L3 to L4 or L1, or correction, L2 to L3. They only develop in adult, uh, they only develop in adults and usually result in some form of flat back or lumbar kyphosis. The sagittal malalignment is what he attributed most of the patient's pains to. Type 2 curves were defined as progressive idiopathic scoliosis that had been present since adolescence or childhood. Once again, the sagittal deformity was almost always exclusively a flat back syndrome with loss of uh, physiologic lordosis and in some cases uh, resulted in kyphosis. Uh, type 3 is considered secondary degenerative scoliosis, was usually located in the thoracolumbar or lumbar segments. It occurs either from within the spine or outside the spine and may be a result of idiopathic congenital or neuromuscular conditions or a result of lumbosacral anomaly. And type 3B was due to bone weakness, i.e. metabolic bone disease such as osteoporosis. This classification system did not address the varying severities of deformity and did not significantly guide treatment. However, within the classification system, we begin to see the beginnings of attention on sagittal balance, which the author mentions often when describing the various types. So Lowe et al. Have, along with the Scoliosis Research Society proposed his classification system for adult spinal deformity in 2006. Prior to this classification system, uh, or prior to this one, classification systems were primarily focused on pediatric scoliosis and did not take into account important considerations that are inherent in the deformity of the adult spine. 
the recognition of symptomatic degeneration changes within the deformity, including stenosis, spondylolisthesis, and rotational subluxation were considered critical for the effective classification system in an adult. Additional global imbalance of the spine in the sagittal and coronal plane is rare in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, but is an important impact on health and treatment and the options in the adult patient. The role of non-operative care, decompression alone, limited stabilization, or long fusions has not been well-defined and will remain poorly defined in the absence of a cl valid classification system that can be used to categorize and to report outcomes on specific presentations of adult spinal deformity. An evidence-based approach to the management of adult spi def spinal deformity requires a valid classification system as a starting point. So these uh, authors define six major coronal curve types, single thoracic, double thoracic, double major, triple major, thoracal lumbar, and lumbar. Once again, the thoracic cur uh, curves have an apex between T2 and the T11, T12 disc, thoracal lumbar between T12 and L1, and lumbar between L1, L2 disc, and L4. Primary thoracic required a curve of greater than 40 degrees in the C7 plumb line to lie lateral to the apical vertebral body of the curve. 40 degrees was chosen in order to identify curves of significant magnitude to warrant consideration of extension uh, of extensive uh, instrumentation and fusion. Upper thoracic curves are structural if the first thoracic rib or clavicular tilt is greater than or equal to five degrees with the elevated side on the ips lateral to the apex of the deformity. Thoracal lumbar lumbar curves include a curve magnitude of 30 degrees in the center of sacral vertical line that passes lateral to the apical vertebra about vertebral body of the curve. A sagittal only deformity consists of no major coronal curve and any sagittal modifier that is out of normal range, which is listed here. The lumbar Degenerative modifier was added to quantify the lumbar degeneration that is often a present in adult deformity, but not in juvenile. Finally, the global balance modifier is used to identify any coronal or sagittal imbalance. With regard to reliability, 14 surgeons completed evaluations for 25 cases. Inter-observer reliability kappa for curve was 6.64, regional sagittal modifier was 0.73, lumbar degeneration was 0.65, and global balance was 0.92, all of which are in the substantial to excellent range. The primary role was to allow for taxonomy to enable comparison of light cases between centers and inclusion within multi-center studies. Secondarily, it was to help provide guidance for optimal care and contribute to the evidence-based approach to the management of adult deformity. The reviewers of adult cases uh, used for validation had substantial reliability in the inter-observer recommendations for CAUDAD fusion uh, level of with a K of 0.77 and were within one level of for cephalod with a moderate, moderate kappa of 0.56. It, however, does not include presentation symptoms, comorbid conditions, age, and other epidemiologic factors that can influence both treatment and outcomes. Around the same time, Rusili published his classification of adult spinal alignment. In his words, normal coronal alignment is well-defined, i.e. straight. However, the natural curve of the spine in the sagittal plane makes it hard to define what is normal, and the significant variance within an asymptomatic population only serves to make defining normal more difficult. He took 160 volunteers with no history of scoliosis or chronic back pain and obtained full-length standing AP lateral radiographs. He then attempted to classify the sagittal curve into four types. To do this, he identified some important radiographic parameters that he used to delineate the curves. To start, he used sacral slope based on the types was less than 35 degrees for types one and two, 35 to 45 for type three, and greater than 45 for type four. To differentiate between one and two, he looked at the lower doses tilt angle. If it fell within L5, uh, it was a type one, L4 was a type two. This was a cross-sectional study identifying normal anatomy. However, they did note that asymptomatic uh, patients were usually type three, while patients with uh, symptomatic disc herniations were most often type one and two, and those with claudication were type four. As the interest in sagittal alignment increased, Lafage et al. published this perspective in clinical analysis in spine in 2009. They looked at 125 adults suffering from spinal deformity with a mean age of 57 years. Full-length freestanding radiographs, including the spine and pelvis, were obtained, and patients filled out this health uh, related quality of life measures. There was no correlation identified pertaining to coronal plane parameters. However, sagittal vertical axis and trunkal inclination both correlated with ODI, SF12, and SRS uh, measures. Pelvic tilt also showed a correlation in both quality of life measures and sagittal vertical axis. They determined that a high values of pelvic tilt expressed compensatory pelvic retroversion for spine, sagittal spine uh, malalignment. As you can see in these charts, as a pelvic tilt increased, the ODI increased and the SF12 uh, physical component score decreased. The chart on the right shows how the groups are broken down. The authors also looked at combining pelvic tilt with sagittal vertical axis. They created four categories in which ANOVA analysis revealed significant differences in the quality of life scores. Pain and disability increased as patients moved from category one up through category four. 
This is important because I identified important radiographic uh, parameters that correlated with disability and quality of life. A good classification system should take this into account. Additionally, if surgeons can restore some of these radiographic parameters, it might help guide treatment. So around the same time as Rusili published his classification of adult spinal alignment. Oh, sorry, wrong way. In 2012, Schwab et al. published a validation study of an updated classification system that both simplified the schema as well as included pelvic parameters. It was initiated by the Scoliosis Research Society Adult Deformity Committee to revise the previously published classification system. Nine readers graded 21 pre-marked cases twice, each one week apart. Kappa values were calculated. Intra-observer intra kappa for curve type was 0.8 and 0.87 for the two readings with a modified modifier kappa of 0.75 and 0.86 and above 0.97 for pelvic incidence minus lumbar lordosis, pelvic tilt, and sagittal, sagittal vertical axis. Coronal curves were simplified to thoracic, thoracal, lumbar, lumbar only, and double with, th with 30 degrees used as a cutoff. Thoracic curves greater than 30 with a lumbar curve less than 30 were defined as thoracic only. Similarly, thoracal lumbar and lumbar only had a curve greater than 30 with thoracic curve less than 30, and a double curve had both thoracic and thoracal lumbar or lumbar curves greater than 30. Three sagittal modifiers were added in. Pelvic incidence minus lumbar lordosis with the parameters here. Global alignment was carried forward, but only using sagittal alignment. And pelvic tilt was either less than 20, 20 to 30, or greater than 30. So for example, the curve on the right has a thoracic Cobb angle of 72 degrees, apex T9, lumbar lord uh, 59 degrees, apex L2, L3, pelvic incidence of 59, lumbar lordosis of 44, so a PI minus LL of 11, pelvic tilt of 24, and a sagittal vertical axis of 16. It would be defined as a double curve with a PI minus LL positive, or one plus and PT one plus. The authors found excellent inter-rater reliability for curve type and modifier with the entire classification coefficient greater than 0.81. It incorporates sagittal alignment and pelvic alignment, which recent studies have underlined the importance of on spinal pelvic alignment, along with pain and disability. As more adult deformity is treated and the classification system becomes more important to facilitate an evidence-based approach to evaluation and treatment of adult deformity, this classification system will likely continue to evolve. As the authors concluded, the high degree of reliability demonstrates that applying the classification system is easy and consistent. Rusili continued to publish multiple articles on sagittal plane alignment. Most recently, he and his team readdressed the classification. Specifically, they wanted to address asymptomatic patients with an anniverted pelvis included within their classification. This prospective radiographic study of 296 asymptomatic patients, they assessed the pelvic incidence, sacral slope, pelvic tilt, lumbar lordosis, lordosis tilt angle, and total number of lordotic, lordotic vertebra, and the C7 plumb line, <clears throat> excuse me, sacrofemoral distance ratio. They identified a fifth type, which they termed 3AP. It was a type three curve with a low grade pelvic incidence. Once again, they use the same sacral slope cutoffs for each of the groups. Here's an algorithmic method to determine the type of curve. If the sacral slope is less than 35, the curve is either type one with less than or equal to three lordotic vertebra or type two if there's more than three. If it is a type three, the sacral slope is between 35 and 45. And if the pelvic incidence is less than 50 and pelvic tilt less than five, it is a type three AP. And finally, if the sacral slope is greater than or equal to 45, it's type four. This image on the right is taken from their article. They note that preoperatively, the patient had an anniverted pelvis with a near zero pelvic tilt who complained of severe low back pain and high disability when attempting to stand upright. The fusion led to decreased lumbar lordosis, which induced pelvic retroversion and pelvic, increased pelvic tilt. Of note, this moved the C11 plumb line from anterior to almost neutral and appears to have restored sagittal balance. And note that the C7 plumb line changed with spinal pelvic type. Type one was the most posterior, type three and four of the more anterior positions, which sometimes was even in front of the femoral heads. The authors also note that once again, there's a high correlation between global lumbar lordosis and the sacral slope. They also noted in females in general had a lower pelvic tilt, which they felt represented an important characteristic in female adult deformity correction, suggesting that restoration of lumbar lordosis may be more necessary in women. Finally, they did uh, note that their study population was small and composed mostly of young adults. It was also comprised of only Caucasian subjects, so its generalizability may be limited. So we've discussed sagittal balance a lot over the last few slides and the importance of sagittal balance is beginning to be understood. However, recently in 2016, Bao et al. attempted to address coronal deformity and its importance to spinal balance and deformity correction. He defined three types, type A, which is considered balanced when the coronal balance distance and the, or the horizontal distance between the C7 plumb line and the central uh, vertical sacral line is less than three centimeters. Type B is when the CBD is greater than three centimeters and the line is displaced to the concavity of the lumbar deformity. And type C is when the CBD is greater than three, three centimeters and displaced to the convexity of the deformity. 
This was a two-stage perspective slash retrospective study with 284 patients prospectively recruited in stage one, 99 of which presented with coronal imbalance. Type B had 62, type three had, or C had 37. In stage two, 99 patients who underwent posterior only correction of degenerative lumbar scoliosis were identified. For the stage two patients, quality of life measures included SF36, ODI, and VAS scores, which were obtained and assessed. They found that type C, type C were more likely to have continued coronal imbalance post-correction as seen here on the second table on the top right. They also found that patients with post-operative balance were more likely to have high VA, higher VAS and SF36 scores, underlying the importance of coronal balance as well. They noted that when correcting type C imbalance, an asymmetric osteotomy to correct a type C deformity at the apex may actually worsen the coronal imbalance and recommended a leveling procedure below L4, restoring the horizontal level, level of L4, L5 prior to correcting the concave side of the main curve. So Bao addressed only degenerative lumbar scoliosis. Here, Obed attempted to classify and address deformity up to and including the thoracic spine from a coronal alignment standpoint. He identified two main types, similar to Bao, in which the type was defined by the coronal malalignment either to the convex or concave side of the deformity. Type zero was no malalignment, type one was concave and type two convex. He then assessed the flexibility of the curve to the side bending radiographs, some of which were done over a bolster or post, as well as the location of the curve. The algorithm here demonstrates how the curve was identified and the table on the right loosely details the recommendations for location of the correction. Of note, <clears throat> once again, the identified convex malalignment is requiring special attention as a correction of the main curve and isolation would worsen the malalignment. <clears throat> they concluded that coronal malalignment is a frequent situation both in non-operated ASD patients as well as new onset uh, deformity in patients uh, operated for ASD that is often misunderstood. It is usually associated with sagittal mal, uh, associated to sagittal malalignment, and the direction of the coronal malalignment should be described in relation to the main curve of the deformity. In concave coronal malalignment type one, the correction should be attained at the apex of the main curve. The need of a three column osteotomy depends on its flexibility. In convex and convex like coronal malalignment type two, the correction should be attained at the lumbosacral junction. In coronally aligned patients type zero, they also recommended avoiding. Uh, to avoid postoperative new onset of uh, chronoma alignment, hypercorrection of the main curve should be avoided. On the bottom left is the inter-rater agreement capital values that were obtained by Hayashi et al., who attempted to validate the opioid classification. 15 readers were assigned 28 cases for classification, including full-length standing AP and lateral radiographs. The assignments were then repeated two weeks later and a third time with reference to additional side-bending radiographs. The intra-reader reliability is 0.95, 0.86, and 0.73 for main curve type, subtypes with the first modifier and subtypes with two modifiers. The inter-reader reliability is noted here on the slide, and they concluded that adequate intra- and inter-reader rater reliability with the OB classification, but that side-bending radiographs did not actually improve the reliability. So in conclusion, classifications are important in that they allow surgeons to identify, quantify, and categorize pathologic conditions. Good classification systems are easy to apply, memorable, and both guide treatment as well as help identify prognosis. Adult spinal deformity is a complex pathologic problem with varied presentations, and the most recent classifications, both for sagittal and coronal deformity, help guide treatment. Only recently have surgeons had the tools to correct deformity reliably, and as such, classifications have only recently been created. They will continue to evolve as understanding of the deformity and deformity correction matures. Here are my references and thank you for your time. That was incredible, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it was, um, it was actually probably, I, my score on the spine part of uh, the OE is gonna be better after this presentation, I can, I can tell you that. I, I learned a lot doing it. Yeah, I can tell you did a very, very deep dive into all that. Thank you very much. It was super informative for all of us, even experienced uh, surgeons. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that, sir. I appreciate it.